Hi, Making Gay History listeners. Eric Marcus here. I want to share a very special episode with you that I've been thinking about a lot over the past couple of weeks. But it's not an episode from my archive. It's from another podcast I've been working on with Yale University's Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies. It's called Those Who Were There, Voices from the Holocaust. Like with Making Gay History, our goal with this podcast is to bring history to life through the voices of the people who lived it, and to provide a window into the Fortunoff Archive, which contains more than 4,000 recorded testimonies from survivors of and witnesses to the Holocaust. When I was first asked if I'd be interested in producing those who were there, I knew I couldn't say no. Growing up in a community of Jewish World War II refugees and Holocaust survivors, these are the stories that the people I knew never shared. So as much as I knew about the Holocaust from school and my own reading, these personal testimonies are a revelation. These are the stories we need to hear so we can learn from the past and, one can hope, not repeat it. In this episode, you're going to hear from Leon Bass. His account of growing up black in the 1930s, serving in the segregated military in World War II, and what he witnessed liberating a German concentration camp called Buchenwald is forever etched in my memory. Leon Bass faced racism at every turn, and he chose to stand up and tell his story. The host of those who were there is Eleanor Risa, a playwright, director, singer, and actor who appeared most recently in the HBO series The Plot Against America. Eleanor's parents both survived the Holocaust. So here's Those Who Were There, Voices from the Holocaust. I'll hope you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Or visit thosewhoarethere.org. That's thosewhoarethere.org. My parents insulated us from the kind of pain they had experienced. They never talked about it to us, about the hardships. Um, I guess they figured we would know about it soon enough. You're listening to Those Who Were There, Voices from the Holocaust, a podcast that draws on recorded interviews from Yale University's Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies. I'm Eleanor Risa. Leon Bass was born in Philadelphia on January 23, 1925, the fourth of six children. His parents were born in South Carolina in the 1890s at the beginning of the Jim Crow era. Just after the First World War, they joined the great African-American migration north. They settled in Philadelphia with the hope of making a better life for themselves and their children. As a young man during World War II, Leon volunteered to serve in the United States Army. In April 1945, he and four others from his unit arrived at the Buchenwald concentration camp in Weimar, Germany, just one day after it was liberated. Forty-three years later, on March 16, 1988, Leon is sitting in a studio in Union, New Jersey. He's dressed in a plaid brown and beige sport coat, a white shirt, and striped tie. He wears aviator glasses and sports a trim black mustache. Leon's interviewers are Bernard Weinstein and Mark Linder. Leon recalls the racial discrimination he experienced as a child in Philadelphia. I went to this school uh, where they always taught us to care and love each other, but to also have love of country. We pledge allegiance to the flag every day, just like every other young person in the city of Philadelphia would do. And we said, with liberty and justice for all, (laughs) just like everyone else, only to go out and find, as we matured, that that was not so. As I found out when I went to the theater, when I bought bought my ticket, I was directed to the balcony. It was mandated that I go there because I wasn't good enough to go down on that main floor. And so I began to get a little insight to the society and how the society viewed me, a person of color. And we 
always went to the park. And I recall how I looked through that wire fence at this large swimming pool, which I knew I could never use. I would never be admitted. Because the society was saying loud and clear to me that I wasn't good enough. Those are the kind of things that uh, make you feel bad. I finished school in 1943. I, I went out and I, I volunteered. And when I went down to the induction center, institutional racism smacked me right in the face because the sergeant was there and he told me to go one way when I went through the door and he told my white friends to go another way. And so I went into an all black unit, save for the officers, they were white. When you enlisted, did you realize the military was segregated? You know, you hear, but you don't even think about those things until it hits you in the face. And of course, the thing that made it more real, more painful, was the fact that they sent us south. They sent us right into the heart of the place where people would, uh, there would be a confrontation. We went to Camp Wheeler, Georgia for infantry basic training. And we spent quite a time in Mississippi, right in Camp McCain. We spent almost a year there. And uh, we went on maneuvers into Texas, to Louisiana, and we came back to Little Rock, Arkansas. Now, in all these places, I was given the message of who and what I was as far as the society was concerned. And it was rather frustrating to think that you have made a commitment to your country, and yet your country is saying to you, uh, all right, you, you're okay, but only so far. I went into Macon, Georgia, and attempted to get a drink of water while I was in there. Simple thing like a drink of water. Because you walk around the town and you see a fountain and you go to drink. I went to drink and someone grabbed me and said, boy, you don't drink here. And he pointed to the sign which said white and directed me to another sign which said colored where it was another fountain. And you were, of course, in uniform at the time oh, yes. this happened. Oh, yes, I was a soldier. Like all, all the other black soldiers, we were all experiencing this. Was it your perception, though, that the black troops generally, though, uh, fully understood the fact that uh, while the rhetoric of the war against Nazi racism and so mm -hmm. forth was, was fine, uh, in practice, the country was doing something entirely different? Oh, yes. It was as though you were schizophrenic. <laughs> Our country had, was two personalities, you know. One way we may make the wonderful pronouncements, you know. We, we talk about our Judeo-Christian ethics and... Uh, we're going to make the world a better place for democracy and all that other jazz. But then when you cut down to the real thing and you start seeing the way they operate, uh, you know, things were not, they were not in consonance. And so I began to be an angry, frustrated young black soldier. After my experiences, I really did not want to be in this man's army. Especially after having to stand on a bus when there were no seats at the back, having to stand up for 100 miles looking at empty seats. Yeah, that didn't endear me to, to my country. Um, couldn't eat in a restaurant. I had to go around the back and knock on the door to get food. And, and I'm in a uniform. I, and I saw PWs, prisoners of war from Germany, being allowed to go in a restaurant and sit down to eat. And yet I was not entitled to for that same opportunity. Our unit left by way of Boston, across the Atlantic, and to England, and then across the Channel to La Havre, France. And then we moved up through France and stopped outside of a small town alongside the road and waited for the orders to come down. And it was into this environment that we began to understand what war was all about. The weather was terrible. It had been raining and sleeting and cold and foggy. And we had no idea what was going on at that time because no one had told us that in 1944, around this Christmas season, that the Germans, in a desperate move, trying to win the war, had sort of counterattacked and found a soft spot in the lines and had pushed us back and created a bulge. It's just the Battle of the Bulge. And so that's it. We were in the Battle of the Bulge and didn't know it at the time. And here we are, moving up in darkness. It became my first experience with with death and dying. You see, up to this time, I had never seen anybody even shot or wounded. But here I saw the bodies on the grave registration trucks. I saw the bodies of people that I knew. And I remember another time I saw someone I didn't know 
he happened to be white. He's about my age, and he was on the ground, and his eyes were wide open. They were blue. He had blonde hair, and his hands were frozen above him, his body because the weather was so cold. He had been alongside the road for a while. And I looked down into those eyes, and I realized that I could end up just like that. And that's when I began to question my wisdom for having <laughs> joined the Army. And uh, I wanted to know why I was there. What the heck am I doing here when I can't get a drink of water, when I can't ride on a bus, when I can't eat in a restaurant? And here I am putting my life on the line, fighting for rights and privileges that I'm denied. We went to Weimar and set up our bivouac area and then went immediately with an officer, about five of us. We were in the intelligence reconnaissance section of our unit and we went right to Buchenwald. And that was the day that I was to discover what had really been going on in Europe under the Nazis. Because I walked through the gates and I saw walking dead people. Seriously, walking dead people. And just looking at these people who were skin and bone and dressed in those pajama type uniforms, their heads clean shaved and, and filled with sores due to malnutrition. And here they were coming towards us, making all kinds of guttural statements and using their own language. And it was very difficult for me to comprehend what was going on. I just looked at this in amazement and, and I said to myself, you know, my God, you know, who are these people? What have they done? What was their crime? You know, it's hard for me to try to understand why anybody could have been treated this way. I don't care what they had done. And I didn't have any way of thinking uh, or putting a handle on it. No frame of reference. I was only 20. And so this young man who spoke English began to explain to us the composition of this place, that these people were Jews and gypsies. And they were trade unionists and communists and homosexuals and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, there were some Catholics. There were some, there had been some mental defectives, but they were gone. Uh, we went through a litany of, of groups and names of groups uh, saying that these people had been incarcerated here because they, if I could use the term I used before, they weren't good enough, you see. And they had been put here for one purpose, and that was to be worked until they died, or starved until they died. Uh, I walked around the camp. I went to a barracks. I opened a door. I wanted to go in, but the stench came out, and there was no way in the world I was going to get through that overpowering odor. And so I just stood there, and I looked down on the bottom bunk right near the door, and there was a man there. He was skin and bone. And he was on a, something like a pallet of dirty straw and filthy rags. And he just could barely turn his head and look up at me. And I, I looked into his face, into that skeletal face with those deep set eyes, which I can't forget. But he, he said nothing, and I said nothing to him. You were part of an intelligence team in your outfit that was an officer. Had the officer been briefed? Had the intelligence team been told anything? I can't speak for the officers. We didn't communicate that well, I'll be very frank with you. So if they knew, I didn't know. So it was complete, absolute shock, surprise when you, when you got there. Totally. Totally. Had I been told, I doubt if I could have had in my mind's eye envisioned anything as horrible as what I saw. Terms like Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen and Majdanek and places like that were not, were not known to you. I had no idea that those places existed. Later, much yet later, I began to hear of names of places and realized that there was more than just a Buchenwald, that there were many, many, many Buchenwalds of different names all over Europe and in Russia. Uh, that's what boggles the mind, to think that a group in a society can organize and do it in a systematic way, such a, a program to remove from the world a whole group of people 
and any others that didn't seem, they didn't think uh, were worthy. And, and it just, to me, that was just a little bit much. I, I couldn't put a handle on that. But I saw what I saw in the camp, the, the place where they tortured people, and the blood stains all around and the instruments of torture there, the, the building where they had all parts of the human anatomy uh, stored as a result of their experiments, uh, really labeled and put in jars. And I saw the bodies all around. I saw the clothing of little children, but I never saw any children in that camp. But I saw the clothing piled up, neat piles. Had all the German military left and all yeah. the guards left? Those that got away. I think maybe a few might have been captured. I did see one man. He was being beaten by the inmates. And they wanted us to come and join them. Of course, we didn't. but. It was my understanding that they beat him to death. I'm not sitting in judgment because I, I didn't walk in their shoes. I imagine my voice should have been raised and said, no, no, that's not the way, but I regret to this day that I didn't. I went into that crematorium. There were six ovens, six of them, and I looked into one. I saw that the remains there, the ashes, the bones, the you know, well, <laughs> this fellow said that they took the ashes sometimes and used it as human fertilizer. Can you imagine that? To use the ashes of human beings for fertilizer on fields to grow some crops that you would need to promote the war effort. I, you know, I saw all of these things, probably more that I can't remember, but I came out of there sick to the stomach and I went to the gate to wait. And we all went back to camp on the board of the trucks in silence. Nobody said anything. You never talked about it afterwards? Never. Never. And shortly after that, uh, we were told that our unit was no longer needed and it was disbanded. When I came back, I. I enrolled at Westchester State Teachers College. And my father told me I should be a history teacher. I wanted to be a physical education teacher. He said, no, I think you should take history. History is important. And so I became a teacher of history. I was a happy young man to think that I could get into college. And uh, I discovered, though, that the same pain that I left when I left here was waiting for me. I was walking down High Street with some of my white friends, and we went to a drugstore, and we went in. And they ordered coffee, and I ordered a glass of milk. There must have been about eight cups of coffee, you know, but no milk. And the lady filled the coffee, put the sugar and cream in, and kept looking for the manager until finally she got his attention and beckoned to him. He came over, she whispered to him. And then he called over one of my white friends and whispered to him, and while doing this, looked right at me. And I knew my antenna was up. I had been conditioned. I knew that something was not kosher. And so I waited until finally the fellow came over and he looked at the coffee. He said, let's go, fellas, come on. And he ushered all of us out. And of course, there was some kind of misunderstanding. If the fellow said, wait a minute, wait a minute, the coffee is there. He said, no, no, we don't want any. He said, why? He said, they didn't want to serve Leon. Can you imagine? I put in three years of my life, put it on the line to make it possible for people like that young lady, that manager, or whoever owned that store to function and enjoy the rights and privileges of the Americans. And they were saying to me, just like the Nazis did, just like they told me down in the South, what they told my father, Leon, you're not good enough. What a damnable kind of thing to say to somebody. In 1968, I was asked if I would take over the leadership as principal of a senior high school. It was the Benjamin Franklin High School, and it was for all boys. It was an urban high school populated with predominantly black and Hispanic youngsters. And one day I came to a classroom 
And in that classroom, there was a lady. And she was trying to talk to the young men who were not listening to her. You know, they were doing everything but listening. And I stood at the door and I began to realize that she was a survivor. And she had survived one of the worst camps. She had survived Auschwitz. And she was here today, on this particular day, to share her experience, her pain, if you will. And these young men were not listening. They had their own pain, you know. And, and I understood that, you know, the pain of rejection, the pain of not giving, being given the kind of recognition you deserve. I, I understood all of that. I had been through there. And I knew their pain, but I also knew her pain. And so I had to say to them, hold it, fellas, cool it. <laughs> Listen, what she says is true. I was there. And so they got quiet. And once she started telling her account of what happened at Auschwitz, they really listened. And she told them how she lost her grandmother, grandfather, her parents, brothers, sisters, cousins, all those near and dear who had come into that camp. All of them had gone to the gas chambers and had ended up in the ovens. And of her family, she was the only one that came out of there. And they listened. And they asked her questions, which made me know that she had to reach them. And they came up, looked at the numbers tattooed on her arm, and they thanked her. And they did something I hadn't been done in a long while. They left that room in silence. And of course, she turned to me. She thanked me for my intervention and, and wanted to know more about my experience at Buchenwald. And I began to remember. Was this the first time you had talked publicly First to time I had told anyone that I had been at, at Buchenwald. Not my mother, not my, my family, my children. No one knew that I had been there. It was the first time I acknowledged that I'd seen it. After that, I, I've been talking about it ever since. Anyone that will listen and invite me, I'll go and talk and tell them. Um, because there are people out there who are saying it didn't happen. I know it did happen. And so I don't want them to push it under the rug like they did slavery. I went all through school and knew nothing about that institution and its horrors until I get, became an adult at the graduate school that I found out all the things about slavery that made me most aware of the horrors of that institution that pulled out 40 million souls for free labor all over the world. We had our four million here in this country. And look what it did to us. Uh, racism has just about split us so many different ways till we can't live in harmony with one another. It was an ugly side of our history and ugly things we want to push under the rug. We don't want to deal with it. And I'm saying to people today, you must take history with its beauty and you must take it with its degradation. In, in retrospect, mm -hmm. Dr. Bass, have, have you been able to assess why you went through this period of silence where you, where you couldn't talk about these things. I guess I go back to psychology one, where they say things that are ugly and miserable, you somehow push it back. And I think the other possibility is that I got busy putting my life together, trying to do those things that I wanted to do, like go to school, get a job, get married. Getting and spending became important. And uh, you you don't deal with things like other things. And so I go around telling my story. And of course, I get the people saying, Leon, what are you dealing with this? This is, this is not a black problem. Why? I said, hey, it's not a black problem. It's not a white problem. It's a human problem. And we've got to face it. Really, racism is at the root of all of this. Under that umbrella comes bigotry and prejudice and discrimination. We have come to grips with that institution of call racism. And we have to because we see the ultimate of racism, which was what I saw at Buchenwald. Do we promote racism through our apathy? When we hear and see things, we say nothing because we don't want to jeopardize that which is important to us, our investment in a job, our, our investment among friends. We don't want to disturb our family. So no matter what people say or do, just leave it alone, sweep it under the rug, and somehow it'll go away. But the skinheads are with us. The Klan is with us. It may be dressed in Brooks Brothers suit with attache cases. They may be in doctors. They may be lawyers. They may be the guy who drives a bus. But they're still with us. 
And I always tell the people when I close my talk to them, I always close it with the words of James Baldwin, who said, either we love one another, either we hold to one another, or that sea will engulf us and the light will go out. Leon Bass was inspired to tell his own story by the Holocaust survivor who spoke at his school. In the years that followed, he was a guest speaker at synagogues, churches, universities, high schools, and organizations committed to peace and the elimination of racism, sexism, and anti-Semitism. Leon Bass died in 2015. He was 90 years old. His wife of 53 years, Mary Sullivan Bass, died in 2002. Leon was survived by a son, a daughter, four grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. Leon's daughter, Delia Bass Dandridge, recalls that her father, quote, grew up in a very difficult time in our country, but he had parents who constantly told him he was good enough. She says he passed this message on to his children, his grandchildren, his students, and to all those who needed to hear it. To learn more about Leon Bass's life story, please visit thosewhowerethere.org. That's where you'll find additional background information, photographs, and a link to Leon's memoir, Good Enough, One Man's Memoir on the Price of a Dream. To hear more from those who were there, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also go to thosewhowerethere.org. Those Who Were There is a production of the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies, which is housed at Yale University Library's Manuscripts and Archives Department. This podcast is produced by Nahani Rouse, Eric Marcus, and the Archives Director, Stephen Naren. Thank you to audio engineer Jeff Town and to Christy Tomachek, Joshua Green, and Inga Detaya for their assistance. Thanks as well to Sam Cassow for historical oversight and to our social media team, Christiana Pena and Nick Porter. Leova Gerbin composed our theme music. Special thanks to the Fortunoff family and other donors to the archive for their financial support. I'm Eleanor Risa. Thank you for listening.